Hi, and welcome again to OK Climbing from the BMC with me, Al Grimes. So, in this show, we're going to the Himalayas. Earlier this autumn, a top British alpinist, award-winning British alpinist, Tom Livingstone, succeeded, along with his partner Matt, on the first ascent of the northeast pillar of Tenkang Poche in the uh, Khumbu area of Nepal. Go Tom, yay! However, not long after he announced uh, his success on the internet to the world, he became the subject of a bit of a slagging match based around an article published on Andrew Bisharat's Evening Sands uh, website, based around how Tom and Matt had um, benefited somewhat cheekily from gear left behind on a previous attempt by two North American climbers. Uh, a bit of a storm followed. Uh, Tom got mercilessly slagged off, rightly or wrongly. I don't know. Anyway, if you want to know about that, go and find it on the internet. I'm sure you can find all this stuff. Uh, Evening Sands, Tom Livingstone, Andrew Bisharat, uh, and read up if you're interested. However, I thought I'd catch up on uh, Tom's side of the story, see where he stood now with the climb, how he feels about it, how he reflects on all these things, and what he thinks from the standpoint of a few weeks' distance. Okay, here it is. Okay, climbing with Tom Livingstone. Tom Livingstone, welcome to uh, the show. Uh, we're here to talk about a climb you've done recently in the Kumbu area of Nepal, the northeast pillar of Teng Tengkang Poche. Teng Tang Kang Poche. Something like that, yes. Yeah. That, I'm not I've just quite sure. I've just used all my knowledge of what we're talking about in that first sentence, so uh it'll be over to you from now on. Okay. <laughs> okay, well it was a great introduction, but yeah, all of Desc those things are correct. Describe the mountain if you've seen it from base camp. It's very impressive. You know, sometimes uh kids draw mountains and it's a big pointy thing and it looks cool. Well, this is this is one of those. It's uh, an amazing uh, like pillar of rock, big spire that looks really cool. And then uh, it's got two kind of angles where you see it from the front and it looks really spiky. And then you kind of see it from the side and it has this really long ridge, really aesthetic snow ridge, um, which is not particularly difficult, but makes the mountain a lot bigger and a lot uh, more impressive. So it's quite nice to look at it's also a bit intimidating because mm. it's uh, so steep and so big right is the, is the snowy ridge the line the northeast pillar that's like the, the ridge, that's sorry. like that's like the dessert the main event i guess is the spiky rocky thing that you look at face on and you can't really see the snow ridge right. and then you kind of you look around the side like oh god because then instead of being a nice mountain like that with the summit right at the top it then goes back a long, long, long way along the ridge. Right. So it's, uh, yeah, like the the last bit, um, the stuff that you don't really want to see. Yeah. Because it's... it goes on for a long way. It'd be nice just to like flop over the top of the yeah. uh, pointy bit and be like, okay, that's great. We're going down now. <laughs> but actually, then there's another day or two of snowy, uh, ridgy stuff to right. get to the actual summit. Okay, amazing. So it's dessert, but by the time you've had your main course, you're full up already. Yeah, that's a good way of describing it. You're, right, you're okay. ready. So you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're full. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so it's, it's like a, a very, it was a very tricky uh, route to climb. Um, we benefited a lot from, um, from uh, like having an a initial attempt. I kind of stacked it by falling off uh, an aid pitch on the second day of the first attempt, but we'd benefited a lot from um, being up there and having a look. Uh, and when I fell off, I scraped my finger a bit, which was like really uh, pathetic. I think the worst thing that I hurt was my ego. Um, right. But actually it was definitely a good decision to come down and to uh, like get it seen by a doctor and to wait out some bad weather. And then right. the second time we went up, yeah, yeah, it all went smoothly. Okay, so you can just take, take a step back, Tom. When you're sat in the UK thinking about the Himalayas, what affects your decision about your objectives you choose? What, what, how do you sort of decide on what you're going to do, where you're going to go, what what you're going to do when you get there? Well, sometimes we go to areas that we don't know anything about and we just want to go for a, a cool like 
explore. And so on previous trips, sometimes to Pakistan and places like that, you go to an area that you don't know much about or that yeah. um, you're like, well, why has nobody been there? Or why has nobody climbed that thing? And uh, other times you might go to an area that is an, there's a known challenge or there's a, a known route that people have uh, tried. So that was the case on my first trip to Pakistan. Um, on to Latok One, it was like a, an obvious thing that lots of people have been to right. um, and tried. And I just, I really like climbing and I occasionally like to make things quite difficult. So um, one pitch of hard climbing is great fun. And then you go to Gogarth and you do two pitches and your arms are fried. And then you go to the Verdon and you do five pitches and your arms are fried. And then you go to the to Scotland or you go to Scotland or to the big mountains uh, or to the Alps and you do more and more and more and more and more. And I guess I'm kind of, yeah, quite keen to do more and more and more. Okay. So that's why I am drawn to the Himalayas every now and again. All right, cool. Uh, so, okay, your, your first attempt on Teng Kang Pochi, you said you had a fall. Falls are not very common in the mountains, is that right? Yeah, I wouldn't advise it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Was it from technically um, difficult climbing? Well, actually, it was uh, because of the, this head wall being northeast orientation, it doesn't tend to get much sun, which is a real shame because if this pillar was a south facing thing, it would get loads of sun, all the cracks would be dry and uh, you could you could free climb it. Ah. But because it's predominantly shady and the cracks are kind of a bit full of ice, you want to start free climbing it, but then you do a couple of moves and your hands are numb and then you can't place gear very easily because the cracks are full of snow or ice. So we meant that this meant that we kind of switched to aid climbing quite often hmm. on that attempt. And uh, so I was aid climbing up, not really done much aid climbing, but I get the idea that you put some gear in and that you sit on it. And uh, there it's was quite a, really it's quite a natural activity, actually. <laughs> I know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as soon as I'm pumped, I'll sit on it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really bizarre, actually. Uh, I, I'd done like two aid pitches in the past: one on a route in Pakistan and one on the route in the Alps. And other than that, I basically did, just haven't done any egg climbing because it, I don't know, it's um, it's not very appealing. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> I mean, it's it's cool in a, like a terrifying, I'm going to scare myself kind of way. And I'm sure it'd be great fun on El Cap if you were like in the sunshine, but yeah, not quite so much there. And basically, um, kind of unluckily, but um, probably it was partly my lack of judgment, a uh, piece that I was sitting on ripped, basically. And then I just fell onto the piece below. And uh, in the process, just like, skimmed down the wall uh for a few meters and like tore up the side of my finger so right. it's totally fine now but we carried on for the rest of the day and then matt the guy i was climbing with kind of quite rightly said yeah i think that needs medical attention right so we went down the next day okay right and, and taking a step back again how many days would it take to climb this pillar what sort of size is it for how, how did you envision the the journey to be Multi well, this took us, yeah, this took us seven days, base right. camp to base camp. Right. And I think that was moving fairly steadily. And the uh, pillar itself took five days. And then on the sixth and seventh day, we got up the snow ridge to the top and then down. As somebody who doesn't mountaineer, just like, wow, that's so logistical to carry you got to work out how long it's going to be and carry enough food, like seven days worth of food. And I guess no water, obviously, because you, you melt the water, but it just seems like a lot of logistically, it must be a summon not experienced in that. It's quite full on, isn't it? The it, it is. It is. Carrying but in some ways, yeah, it's super simple. You, you've you got your climbing gear and that's what you need. Yeah. Uh, and we, you know, what, what kind of climbing gear you have, it's like stuff. Uh, and you need your crampons and your ice axes. I mean, it does add up for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we know how to climb. And then we just put six piles of food and make right. them progressively smaller and smaller. Right. <laughs> because uh, ideally, we'd have six huge piles or seven huge piles of food mm. uh, for seven days. But actually, it becomes really, really heavy, as you say. And I suppose uh, you 
uh, yeah, you just have huge backpacks and I don't really like the idea of climbing with a giant backpack. Yeah. So then you make the, the final meals smaller and smaller and the final piles of food smaller and smaller. Right. And then uh, off you go. Wow. Just, you don't know if it'll take you four days or eight days or anything like that. And mm. you kind of um, constantly assess the situation as you're going okay. to see, well, yeah, are we going to get to the top roughly on our seventh day? Are we going to uh, run out of food? I mean, I've right. not, not been one of these like um, impressive Euro, like Russian dudes who's like, oh, yes, we reached the summit, summit on like, well, like, on day eight, we ran out of food, and then we reached the summit on day 16. And you just think, oh, my God, that must be very impressive. Uh, so thankfully, I've never really, like, run out of food to that extent. Yeah. And on this trip, it, it worked out roughly as planned. We were kind of thinking it would take seven days, and it did. Perfect. That was your, your second visit. You, it all went according to plan. No falls. So you met yeah. some difficult air climbing or just straightforward air climbing, some difficult technical climbing and some two days of yeah climbing. it was a nice mix of everything it was sort of 50 yeah. percent really cool climbing um some rock climbing some mixed climbing and that was really enjoyable and then 50 percent was kind of hammering in pegs and putting wires and cams and stuff like that right. the aid climbing part and that was quite slow um i think partly because of the the conditions it was quite cold the cracks were quite full of right. snow and ice and uh, partly because we're not very good at aid climbers, I guess. Right. Um, Sounds like a red right faff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was quite funny that like on day four or five or six, something like that, we both said, hmm, I'm not sure if I would recommend this or do this again. It, yeah. <laughs> it's like taking a winter version of El Cap and a winter version of the Alps and sort of like, <laughs> uh, well, we kind of enjoy free climbing and like moving yeah. and long long pitches rather than long belays but it no, was no. good fun it was an experience yeah yeah well, that's what i thought about air climbing an l cap i just remember getting to the top and thinking i'm never doing that again I'm just <laughs> never doing that again okay. yeah. Yeah. yeah i just couldn't it's, couldn't it's quite see the point me. of it no yeah <laughs> and stir in the fact yeah. that you're really cold and hungry it must be yeah. like super super bad uh yeah, I mean, it was an experience and it was yeah. cool. It was quite cool, to, or it was really cool to climb such an impressive thing. You you get into this valley and you see the side profile of Tenkan Koche and you think, whoa, that's amazing. Because yeah. you see the spire and then you see the ridge going back. And then you get to base camp and you're looking straight at it and you just think, whoa, that would be so yeah. cool. To climb. Wow. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's like a bunch of Gogoths stacked on top of each other and no nice. one in the sea. Right. Ah, beautiful, beautiful. Congratulations. Uh, Thanks. I, I know when you get back, the first bit I became aware of it, there was a bit of a storm on the internet where you were getting some slag. And, and forgive me, but when you sort of, you're sort of sat at, sat at your computer and again, you see, oh, wow, somebody's getting stick about something. This is entertaining. And beyond the fact that you get any sort of massive, or any remotely, any interest in the subject itself, the sort of... Uh, you feed on somebody for a couple of days, don't you? Which is always, as, a, as an observer, a casual observer, quite good fun. Imagine as the subject of these things, it's a very different relationship you have with you. Go, oh my God, what's all this about? And I, I know you get a bit of stick uh, about uh, about from other other parties about their involvement with the route and your involvement with the route. Give us a very quick sketch of what, what the story was from your point of view. Well, I'm glad that it was a source of entertainment for you for a few Very days. Much so. Thank you. I'm yes. surprised to, to, to I didn't see you your name in there, actually. <laughs> you, I'm really surprised you didn't wade in, actually. Just, With a very strong oh, opinion. I thought it was E2, actually, not E3 or something like that. Yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I'm really surprised you weren't in there. Just like throwing a few punches. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the very short version of the story is that um, there was a Canadian guy called Quinton Roberts, and he had tried Tenkan Poche's Northeast Pillar twice, once with a, with a Finnish guy and once with an American guy. And it sounded, he was definitely intending to go back to try Tenkan Poche's Northeast Pillar a third time with the American guy, Jesse. And so when he was trying the pillar in the spring of 2021 he ended up having to bail and 
left a bag of his gear and food and stuff like that um, right at the bottom of the mountain. Uh, it was one day's climbing um, from the bottom of the mountain. And uh, the first time that Matt and I went up, we uh, just saw the bag and we just left it alone. Um, we tried going up and uh, then I fell off and, and uh, we needed to come down. So we left the bag where it was. And the second time we were thinking and I was thinking, um, well, their stuff is on the wall. It would save us a bit of energy and a bit of time if we climbed up and used uh, on the first day without so much food and, and gas. And we used their food and gas, which um, in hindsight was a bit of a bad thing to do. And um, But then again, it was like a bunch of gear left on the wall. And I know lots of people who have said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm leaving this gear on the wall. I'm definitely coming back for it. And in 10 years' time, it, it, they've left it there. Mm. Um, so it is kind of like a, a, a thing that's left on the wall. Um, they said they were coming back for it, and I'm sure they, they would have or are. But, um, yeah, so there was this bag of stuff on the wall, and we decided to eat a lot of their energy bars, um, which were going out of date and to use some of their gas and use a few of their bits of gear. Um, they'd been, Quentin had been very kind in giving us some uh, info on the area and the mountain um, in, in the run up to the trip. And when I, when we got down from Tenga Poche, I messaged Quentin straight away and said, oh yeah, very sorry, we've climbed what you were trying to climb and we've also eaten- Very more. sorry, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I know, well, it felt really weird to write. Imagine like, I don't know what's the equivalent you need to well, the, the, whenever any time I've got into a discussion like this where people keep saying, Oh, it's like whenever two people split up and uh and yeah. the, the girl's mate cops off with the, the bloke and uh and, and that's that's what yeah. everyone says. It's a bit like that and uh I go, okay, I'm really yeah, yeah, sorry yeah. but Yeah, I'm really sorry but I copped off your girlfriend <laughs> or your boyfriend. And in that situation yeah. I always think it's it's uh it's the person who's left the relationship that uh, copped off the other person who's who's done the betrayal in a way, not not the ex, not the not the friend. So it's that's that's who's betrayed the trust of the old person. So, and in that mm. analogy, it's you're not to blame, or Jesse's not to blame. It's the mountain to blame. It's the mountain's fault. Well, I'm not sure if you can. I, I blame, the mountain. blame the mountain. You know, I totally okay. blame the mountain in this situation. I think the the mountain's been very disloyal to both you and to Jesse. Okay. And Good. For well, in that analogy, I was wondering where you it would on. conclude and who would be to blame. You're, it sounds you're like you're blaming totally, the mountain. So, you're okay. totally blameless, Thanks. Tom, in this situation. <laughs> I don't think North America sees it quite that way. Uh, but thank you for, for making me feel... North better. America will come around. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But there, okay. Was, there was the most yeah. enormous sort of... A, I mean, there was definitely a difference of opinion between you guys and, and the other parties, but what, what was agreed or what was understood. And I guess that's, is that always going to happen or was, do you think there was genuine misunderstandings? I think there was a lot of misunderstanding. Um, and I think there was um, a bit of uh, upset, which was very understandable from, from the North Americans. And I think uh, in hindsight, we should have just taken our stuff from, from base camp. Um, but we kind of saw it as litter on the wall almost. Um, and, you know, if someone leaves a bag of stuff up on El Cap for a season, then I'm sure it will be used. Um, did you bring the bag? Did you bring the bag down? No, no. We, we were thinking, what should we do with it? But we just left it in place. I mean, there's some other equipment for them um, of theirs, uh, which we left in, in place. Uh -huh. um, I think they're obviously very upset that we climbed something that they were uh they'd invested time and energy and money into and, and mm. so that's really understandable i would have liked to think that if i was in their situation i would have done the same uh sorry no i i wouldn't have done the same and i would have been <laughs> get your story straight no, I would have, get the story straight <laughs> sorry i'd like to think that in their situation um i would have been acted a bit more differently and i would have said like congratulations, I'm, an, I'm annoyed you've climbed the thing that I've invested my time and energy and effort into, 
but good effort, fair enough. And mm. your bastards for um, taking our gear, but I would have said fair enough. Like go for go for it if you use the gear or use the um, if you use our food, that's great. Fine, go for it. Let us know what you use and and we can sort it out afterwards. Um, <laughs> and I don't think I would have. Um, tried to let the shitstorm play out in the way it did uh, if I was in their situation. I don't right, think yeah. I would have gone to an American website and given them a story like that. I it, think, I know I would have just messaged them privately or publicly yeah. and been like, well, uh, come on guys, tell the full story straight away. And the yeah. reason why I didn't tell the full story straight away was because I was speaking with uh, Quentin and I messaged him straight away um, as soon as I got the uh, as soon as we got down hey sorry I've planned a thing and also why did you say sorry uh, why, why did you say sorry why because uh, because I know if that he, he's invested he, time and energy into it and but if he knew you were going to do it it's sort of that's whatever well, yeah but still I, I, I find myself well it's very good to apologize I don't know yeah. it feels feels very british exactly um i'm very sorry I'm very sorry i just won a gold medal for the olympics i'm really sorry to beat number two and three i don't know i think i would apologize if i'd won a gold medal for anything um i don't know it's sort of my personality and also i yeah i know that he's spent some time on it um but then um yeah for him to be uh they said some terrible Upset things. Well. They said some terrible things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we've Slimy. been called oh. some intri interesting <laughs> names. I think it's all a bit ridiculous. But um, yeah, I think if I was really emotionally involved about this, or if I was, if I was one, if I really, really took these names to heart, that'd be pretty bad. Yeah. I'm lucky that it's like good that. Uh, yeah. Not yeah. to go out and like, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's difficult. I'm trying to find a measured response. I'm yeah, trying yeah. to find a, a, a balance to, to show that I care, but also that I, I don't care that people have called me slimy and people have called me scum, which is a bit unfair. <laughs> I mean, people <laughs> messaged Matt and said, we're going to tell all your sponsors to drop you. And Matt is just a, <laughs> a, a cool guy and he doesn't have any sponsors. So he was like, well... <laughs> <laughs> um okay i think yeah i think um the whole thing has been quite an interesting experience um yeah yeah i think the last was, the last i read was i think it was i think it was jesse wrote on the internet uh well done tom and I, I really hope this all blows over and then went on they write four paragraphs of slagging you off after, after that. oh good okay yeah i mean i've stopped reading all these things so i should probably catch up on that um <laughs> Got some homework to do. You got some yeah. homework. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and now, if if you met if you met those guys now, what would happen? You just I don't know. Don't know what'll happen. It's, it's not down to you. It's down to you all in it. Well, I'm sure we'll meet again uh, in the future. The climbing world is pretty small. The climbing mm. community is pretty small. Uh, I guess it's tiny. That I guess that that world's tiny. Isn't it? Like this. That that world's tiny. I guess that sort of Himalayan exploratory first ascent type stuff is probably a really small world yes um yeah it's a bit of a shame um and i'm sure if i met them then uh we'd be able to have a mature conversation about how they feel and uh hopefully we could be able to move on mm. yeah 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 and at the end of the day tom you've done the new route you've done the route that's amazing isn't it it's, well, I'm very I, psyched about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a and fantastic it, experience. I mean, it's a shame that it's ended like this because there's like a, uh, yeah, a very strange end to it. Yeah. One of the you reasons are... why I didn't credit them at the start with, I think a lot of the problem um, came about because I didn't credit Quentin publicly. I'd only privately messaged him mm. um, on the, and the the first Instagram post that I did, which to which was to say that we'd done it, we'd mm. done Ten Campoche, and rather tragically, three French friends had died in the mountains in the previous days. So oh, I no. had a, a limited amount that I could post on Instagram, and so instead I 
posted uh, about this really sad news and some respect to the French people and offered my condolences uh, instead of crediting Quentin with using his gear or saying, oh, I'm sorry, we've used your gear. So, yeah, it was a bit of a real shame. I was sort of trying to do the right thing by paying respects to some friends and instead uh, missed out the Quentin, um, sorry, we've used your gear public part yeah. of the thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it was all, yeah, a big learning experience and um, yeah, have to be very careful. Social media has to be kept at arm's length and yeah. you shouldn't feel any rush to post or any, uh, yeah, any hard feeling. Oh, Tommy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. It is a thing in it, social media, the way it brings out that. Uh, aspect of things i guess in a way yeah it's yeah. it's uh it doesn't allow time for reflection i guess no and it's very interesting that you could say things to people that you wouldn't say in uh or to their face yeah it's yeah. a bit of a shame <laughs> i know yeah <laughs> but, <laughs> i know it's a shame but as i say as someone sat behind a computer we we uh, we thank you for your for what you've contributed to the <laughs> world <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. If I can be a small contribution to uh, to helping you guys through your day, help us um, help us feeling better great. about ourselves. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true. Yeah, I must message Jesse and Andrew to say thank you as well. <laughs> yeah, do do. I'm sure that that'd be really. Maybe you could write something to re. No, actually, don't write anything to rekindle it. But um, yeah, no, okay. <laughs> Hey, amazing, Tom. Really glad. No, awesome. When I saw when I see photographs of that the thing he climbed, go, wow, that's amazing to climb that. So I hope that becomes the overwhelming emotion in Thanks. good time. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You and your mate Matt, who don't know, you never met. I don't think so. Yeah. So congratulations to you both and, and a great ascent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Cheers, Mugger. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>